My name is Kevin, and I'm one of the co-founders of Nervous Project.、Um, so I can I can just take a few minutes to talk about, you know, what Nervous Project is. So I think a lot of you guys probably have a, a Bitcoin a background or very familiar with Bitcoin.、Um, so if you think about, you know, Bitcoin like in BTC and and Lightning Network,、uh, so essentially BTC is a very secure store value, and then you have you know Lightning Network as a transaction. Uh, system, right, to do efficient transactions. So what we're trying to do、uh, is pretty much inheriting the, this philosophy of、uh, BTC Bitcoin.、Um, so we also have a very、uh, secure layer one protocol.、Uh, it's called Nervous CKB. But instead of just、uh, you know can express payments,、uh, Nervous CKB can ex- just like Ethereum can support、uh, smart contracts, right? So just like Bitcoin is a store of value. Uh, the value proposition for Nervous CKB, the Layer One protocol, it's store of assets.、Uh, the reason that we do this is we feel like once we have like a multiple layers, like a Bitcoin Lightning, then the base layer has to be a good、uh, protocol, not designed for transactions. Right? The reason is, you know, when all the transactions are pushed to Layer Two, then you want to make sure your protocol can still provide. Security to the assets、uh, on top of it. So if there's zero transactions on Nervous CKB on our Layer One protocol, then we're going to still be secure, right? Whereas、uh, you know other smart contract platforms may have their tokens de-、uh, designed to facilitate transactions. So if there's no transactions, then、uh, you know there's no intrinsic value for for the token, right? So that's one. Also,、uh, you know for Nervous CKB, for example. Uh, the native token is designed to capture the value of the assets, and that's the only way you can have a sustainable store of asset platform.、Uh, you know, sometimes I I give an example of, you know, for platform like Ethereum, you know, if all the aggregate assets on Ethereum, you know, the price、uh, go up a hundred a hundred times, then there's no intrinsic reason that Ether will also follow that trend and go up in hundred times price, right? So in other words. Uh, the economic model for Ether、um, does not provide a superior, a good value capture mechanism for the assets. But once you are a store of assets platform, you have to do that, right? So otherwise, you're going to be increasingly attacked.、Um, so yeah, so those are the you know some of the thoughts that went into designing uh, our uh, platform. So again, it's you know it's a very secure and store of assets pl- platform in the middle. And then there are a lot of transactional system around it. So if you guys are, you know, familiar with like a Polkadot or Ethereum 2.0,、uh, they all kind of have a similar topology, right? So something in the middle, and then you have a lot of,、um, you know, satellite chains or pair chains or shards.、Um, so we kind of have similar topology, but、uh, you know, our insight is.、Um, so the two things that can all coexist、uh, is. A preservation-based economic、uh, design, protocol design, and the transaction-based economic protocol design, right? So this is why we feel like one layer should be about you know security of assets, and the other layer is、uh, about facility transactions. So I'm happy to talk more about this, but、uh, just want to see whether they're ready.、Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. This is our monthly speaker event that we like to do. Um, to this month, we have a couple of、uh, researchers from Nervos. We're going to talk about kind of different methods out there for scaling up Bitcoin. Obviously, this is going to be a big issue going forward, but、uh, we'll have more information from them.、Um, so, with that,、um, did you want to introduce the speakers, or I could just I just call up Ren and we can go from there. All right, cool. Okay, so、uh, Ren's going to go ahead and start us off. We're going to do a joint Q and A at the end. So, any questions you have, just kind of. Make a note of them or remember them, and, and we'll cover them together with both speakers. All right. Thank you, Ren. I think just to clarify a little bit, our second speaker, Patrick, is not a researcher of Nervos. He's an assistant professor at UCL.、Um, okay. Good evening. <coughs> NCMax is the consensus protocol of Nervos, a public permissionless blockchain, but this is just a temporary name. NC、uh, stands for Nakamoto Consensus, which is the consensus protocol of Bitcoin. If you have a good idea how it should be named, please feel free to come to me afterwards. <laughs> My name is Ren Zhang. I'm a researcher at Nervos.
And I'm also a PhD student of Bart Preneel of Kozik Research Group, KU Leuven. If you're not familiar with Kozik, it's the birthplace of AES, the advanced encryption uh, standard which is used in all of your cell phones. And if you're not familiar with Bart Preneel, he's the designer of RIP MD160, known in the Bitcoin space. RIP MD160 is the hash function you use to, to compute from your <coughs> Bitcoin public key to your Bitcoin address. So it's kind of... Um, Nervous is a public blockchain that supports smart contracts in all programming languages and has built-in support for all layer two protocols we are aware of. It, you can pay transaction fee in arbitrary asset, and it separates smart contract execution from verification for better privacy and better uh, performance. Last but not least, it uses NCMAX, a variant of Nakamoto consensus with higher throughput as its consensus protocol. So a disclaimer, this talk is only about layer one consensus protocols. I will not talk about sharding or lightning network. You can expect Patrick to tell you something about layer two. <clears throat> so here's an outline of this presentation. First, I will tell you about uh, why we love Nakamoto consensus and what we would like to change. Second is why we don't choose alternative consensus protocols. And last, I will introduce our own design. So why we love Bitcoin's Nakamoto consensus? We like it for its performance optimization. It is optimized to save every bit of transmission and every cycle of computation. For example, it uses compact block to accelerate block propagation. And it uses mini sketch to um, save bandwidth for transaction propagate, propagation, hopefully in the future. And Bitcoin developers also develop graph root. It's, um, you can think of it as a compression. It's a way to compress Bitcoin smart contract for better privacy and better performance. And hopefully we can see signature ag aggregation adopted in Bitcoin. We also like it for its generalizability. Its UTXO model plus global order of transactions allow support for all sharding and layer two solutions and complicated smart contract. In contrast, Ethereum's account model is very difficult to shard. And if you don't have a global order of transactions like many DEX, it is difficult to support complicated smart contracts. We like it for its security. Empirically, it is launched 10 years ago and survived many attacks. And formally, there is no known proof of work protocol that comprehensively outperforms Nakamoto consensus. If you're interested in more information about this topic, you can watch my talk tomorrow at Stanford Blockchain Conference at 10.30. There's a live stream. However, there are two things we would like to change in Nakamoto consensus. First, the protocol prescribes a manual throughput limit of four megabytes every 10 minutes. Although the bandwidth of Bitcoin public nodes has increased significantly in the past several years, there isn't a way to adjust the protocol to enjoy the increase of public nodes bandwidth. A natural question would be, oh, just as indicated in this study, <coughs> Bitcoin's um, IPv4 IPv nodes, which used to, be connect, uh, used to be connected to the network with a median bandwidth of 32 megabits in 2016, has a, have a median bandwidth of 56 megabits as of February 2017. A natural question would be, can the, throu can the protocol itself dynamically adjust the throughput? A bad attempt of this approach is Bitcoin Unlimited. It hopes to increase the throughput dynamically, but instead, it introduces several new attacks that weakens the security of the protocol. By the way, I was the one conducting this research. The second thing we would like to change is its incentive issue, namely the infamous selfish mining attack. In this attack, the selfish miner withhold the discovered blocks, hoping to gain a larger lead on the blockchain, on the public network. And when other miner finds a block next, the selfish miner broadcasts the blocks to the network, the, uh, the secret block to the network, hoping that the secret block will reach most of the 
compliant miners before the attack before the competing block. If the if the attacker is lucky enough, the next block is mined. After the attacker block, the honest block is orphaned. If the attacker is lucky enough to find more than one block in a row, he can safely invalidate compliant miners' block because the attacker has a longer chain. And why is selfish mining profitable? Assuming here's an, a concrete example. Assuming that the attacker's mining power alpha equals 30%, and honest miner power honest miners control 70%. Without the attack, the attacker can find three blocks in turn, and the honest miner can find seven in turn on average. However, with the attack, the attacker finds three blocks in seven and the honest miner finds four blocks in seven because three of the honest blocks are orphaned by the attacker and the main chain grows slower. In the next epoch, in the next difficulty adjustment period, the difficulty lowers because the main chain grows slower and the attacker gets more reward with the same electricity consumption. That's why selfish mining is profitable. Selfish mining is not profitable in the first epoch of the attack it is only profitable after the difficulty adjustment mechanism. And the difficulty lowers precisely because the main chain grows slower in the last epoch. Is that clear? This is a little bit technical. I was told to be slower when talking about technical stuff. <laughs> Why we don't choose alternative consensus protocols? So, like, there are three approaches that doesn't use Nakamoto consensus or doesn't entirely adopt Nakamoto consensus. Proof of stake, DAG, and two block types. Note that these three approaches are not exclusive to each other. It's possible to, ad to adopt several of them. Um, let's take a deeper look at their security functionality and throughput. First, proof of stake. So all proof of stake protocols introduce some new security assumptions. For example, Algorand requires that most honest users can send messages that can be received by most other honest users within the known time bound, which means if you hold some Algorand token according to the original design, you have to be always online. If you are not online, you are not a valid token holder. And Ouroboros requires, which is used in the cryptocurrency Cardano, Ouroboros requires that all players have a weekly synchronized clocks and all messages are delivered within delta time. This is a very strong assumption, in case you didn't notice. There are numerous attacks to, attack, to bias the clock of your mining gear, of your public nodes, of your cell phone. And this is very hard to realize in reality. And Sleepy protocol also requires players are encrypted with roughly synchronized clocks. When these security assumptions are violated, which will result in catastrophic results in this proof of stake protocols. And it also introduced several new attacks, uh, new attacks that was previously doesn't exist in proof of work protocols. For example, nothing at stake attack, grinding attack, long range attacks, and I'm not gonna enumerate them. So what about DAG protocols? All, all DAGs has the transaction order problems. If you allow blocks to be produced simultaneously, then different miners or different public nodes will have inconsistent views on total transaction order. So I think these transactions are confirmed while the others may consider a different set of transactions being confirmed. So at this stage, you have two options to solve that problem. Option one is you settle the transaction order after the blockchain topology is fixed, which means you have to wait a very long confirmation delay. Option two is that you leave the transaction undecided forever, which means some of the tokens are stuck in the smart contract or in the blockchain forever. Nobody can spend them anymore, which will limit the smart contract functionalities because some of the function call may be benign, but you lock the money anyway. And what about these um, protocols with two block types? Namely, they use a key block, which is similar to Nakamoto consensus block, to 
safely confirm transactions and use micro blocks, that like blocks that are bro broadcast between key blocks to increase the throughput. These protocols usually will have very long confirmation delay, similar to um, DAC protocols. In Bitcoin NG, the paper explicitly said that a user who requires high confidence will not gain better latency with Bitcoin NG, but must wait for several key blocks to accept the transaction as completed. In Bitcoin, they have a similar problem. So, what about their throughput? All these alternative consensus protocols claim to have very high throughput, right? Solana claims to be able to process 710,000 transactions per second. I think if you have a techn technological breakthrough like that, you deserve a Turing Award. <laughs> so I can't wait for them to get the reward. And this protocol called NKN, they promise that they can have 10,000 nodes with 1 million transactions per second. For the record, I don't know how it works, but I'm really curious to learn about it. I'm also curious why Stellar and Ripple are Nakamoto consensus in their category. And I'm curious whether these 10,000 nodes are aware of this 1 million transactions per second. If you want to dream, you better dream big. This is a protocol that really dreams big. It, <laughs> It claims to achieve 10 to the power of 12 transactions per second and with a final confirmation time of under one second. I think the Earth is really not enough for them. They really need to find another planet who is big enough to deploy their protocol. So my point is self-claimed self TPS are not comparable. Some of these TPS may be true, I don't know. <laughs> but they are not comparable because they are simulated under different network conditions. Some of the simulations, they use a network nodes of one gigabyte per second bandwidth. That is clearly not the reality. And the neglecting real world factors. None of the simulations consider transaction synchronization. For them, the transactions are always already synchronized in their blocks. The purpose of the consensus protocol is only used to order these transactions, which is far from reality. And some simulations assume direct link between committee members, but in reality, every message is broadcast. Because broadcast message will consume bandwidth of the public nodes. So here is our model for TPS comparison. We believe a public node's bandwidth is capped by 100%. You cannot go beyond 100%. And this bandwidth consists of three parts. The first part is the percentage of bandwidth used to synchronize transactions that are eventually confirmed. This is the real TPS, transactions per second. You need to first synchronize the transaction, then you can confirm them. The second part is the percentage of bandwidth wasted by the consensus protocol. The, thir the third part is the underutilized uh, bandwidth. So the TPS is capped by 100%. And if you want to increase the TPS, there are only two things you can do. The first is the, you lower the consensus protocol's bandwidth consumption. The second is that you lower the underutilized bandwidth consumption. This is just these two things. You cannot do more than that. And you cannot go beyond 100% for layer one protocols. So let's look at this um, alternative consensus protocol bandwidth uh, consumption. Many of them waste their bandwidth, waste their precious bandwidth on committee member communication. Algorand stores block certificate in order to prove new users that prove to new users that the block was committed. So each block certificate is 300 kilobytes, independent of the block size. If you use one megabyte blocks, which means around 25% of bandwidth is forever wasted for um, synchronizing these certificates. So I was really wondering why they claim that their, their throughput is better than Nakamoto consensus. It doesn't make any sense. The second, second way to waste your bandwidth in consensus protocol is redundant transaction in the DAX and orphan blocks. As indicated in this paper, if all the nodes in the DAG chooses the same subtype of transactions for inclusion in their blocks, any two blocks that are created in parallel are likely to have many collisions, and throughput will not be high. Currently, all of the DAG protocols turn a blind eye on this 
situation. So the throughput is not satisfiable for us. So what's our op opinion on this? So here's three major innovations of NCMAX. To reduce orphans, we use two-step transaction confirmation. To best utilize the bandwidth, we use dynamic block interval and block reward. To defend against selfish mining, we consider all blocks in the difficulty adjustment. Let me elaborate on that. So Nakamoto consensus has a natural throughput limit. Why is that? Because in Nakamoto consensus, if you want to raise the throughputs, there are two things you can do. The first is that you increase the block size, as can be seen in Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin Cash. I couldn't uh, keep track of them. There are too many of them. And the second thing is that you lower the block interval. However, if you raise the block size or you lower the block interval, the orphan rate will increase. And these orphans, they consume bandwidth and they don't contribute to transaction confirmation. As your orphan rate increases, the security of the system goes down and the throughput goes down. So eventually there will be a balance in terms that the orphan is high enough that the throughput cannot go any higher, even if you try to lower the block size, uh, try to lower the interval or increase the block size. So why are too many orphans bad for security and performance? As can be seen in this figure, when the orphan rate is very high, it's easier for the attacker to secretly generate a longer chain. The, the attacker doesn't need 51% of mining power. It can override the blockchain with much less mining power. And also these orphans, they can consume a lot of bandwidth of public nodes, which, affects, which negatively affects the throughput of the system. So how do we break NSA's throughput limit? If we want to break it, we need to lower the orphan rate. So the orphan rate is lower, the security can be better, and the throughput can be better. But how do we lower the orphan rate? The orphan rate comes from the block propagation delay. If during the propagation procedure of one block, another block is discovered, one of them is destined to be orphaned. So if blocks can be propagated instantly, there will be no orphans. So how can we make sure that the blocks are propagated fast enough, given that Bitcoin's developers already put a lot of effort in it to accelerate block propagation? We need to take a deeper look at where are some blocks propagated slower than the others. Some blocks propagated slower because these blocks have more fresh transactions. Fresh transactions are transactions that has been generated in five seconds ago or 10 seconds ago. These transactions are not synchronized in the network. So during the block propagations, miner will have to synchronize these transactions before they can further propagate the block. Let's take a deeper look how this happens. So in Nakamoto consensus, uh, sorry, in the current implementation of Bitcoin, if everything goes well, a block will be very likely be propagated through a protocol called compact block. In compact block, transactions are not actually propagated as the entire transaction, which is 200 and 300 bytes. It is propagated as a truncated transaction ID, a uh, compact Compact block ID. So this compact block ID, uh, uh, so these transactions, truncated transactions consist, um, will compile the compact block. And this compact block is much smaller than an actual block. <clears throat> if when node A propagate this compact block to node B, and for node B there's no fresh transactions in it, node B can immediately transfer this compact block to all its neighbors, which is nice. However, when there are fresh transactions in the block, node B would have to first synchronize these fresh transactions from node A and then verify whether this ver verify the signatures of these fresh transactions, which also takes time. And only when the validity of the entire block is validated can node B keep propagating this block. This is the main source of Bitcoin's pro block propagation delay. Is that clear? Hmm. So Ethereum is a bad attempt. <laughs> let, let me tell you how they did it. <laughs> so Ethereum simply shortened the block interval. But Ethereum has a problem that it is impossible to verify transaction validity 
before receiving the actual block because the validity of a transaction depends on the order of the transaction within the block. So if you want to verify a, tra uh, verify a transaction, you have to wait until the block is ready. So every block is fresh transaction. And it has poorly maintained network protocol. The network protocol of Ethereum has no update since 2015. And it is, there are a lot of redundancy in transaction propagation. Ethereum client will propagate the same transaction seven times to different nodes, which means for each node, he will receive the same transaction seven times. And it has inconsistencies in different clients. The two main client implementation of Ethereum, Ethereum are basically se separated from each other. So there are very few nodes that connect these two different networks. So, so Ethereum has a very high orphan rate of up to 30% sometimes, and very low transactions per second. And big miners have no incentive to accelerate prop block propagation, because if my block can be propagated slower, it means I can perform a de facto selfish mining, which is in favor of me. Why would I accelerate block propagation? An uncle reward surely doesn't help, because even if my block is orphaned, I can still get some reward. So small miners cope with this with header-first header block propagation and empty blocks. So I will not propagate the content of the entire block. I will just propagate the header, because it's so much faster. And because I don't know what's, what transactions are included in the last block, I will mine an empty blocks to make sure that my block will not contain a conflicting transaction with the previous block which is bad because these empty blocks do not contribute to transaction confirmation. So how do we do it? This is the Bitcoin block um, format. We modify it by increasing several fields. First, we have a transaction proposal zone. This transaction proposal zone contain, may contain some fresh transactions. And the traditional transaction confirmation zone Mass can only contain transactions that was proposed several blocks before. For example, between two blocks before and five blocks before. Only these transactions can be confirmed. New transactions cannot be confirmed in the transaction confirmation zone. And the transaction proposal zone only contains truncated transaction IDs, namely the shorter version of the transaction ID. So the, so the transaction proposal zone can be really small. And also, a block can include as many uncle blocks as you want. Uncle blocks should uh, propagate their headers and their transaction proposal zone in the block. And uncle blocks don't count in block size limit, so that miners are not discouraged to um, include uncle blocks in their block. So let me give more detail about the transaction proposal zone. It is small because it only contains truncated transaction ID and the complete transactions are synchronized after propagating the block. So they are synchronized in parallel. They will not affect the block propagation uh, procedure. And it does not affect block validity as long as the hash checks. So which means it, in the transaction proposal zone, there may be invalid transactions, double spending transactions, and miners may refuse to provide some transactions in this zone. We, these are also fine. So, Recall that this is Bitcoin's block propagation. In our protocol, this is our compact block, which is slightly larger than Bitcoin's compact block. And compact, uh, compact block is always propagated immediately to your neighbors. And the newly proposed transactions, if some of them are missing in your transaction pool, they can be propagated after you send out the compact block. These two are parallel processes. They don't affect each other. And then these transactions are verified and propagated and to the next neighbor and etc. Several natural questions. What if miners refuse to provide the complete version of proposed transactions? I put this transaction ID in my transaction proposal zone, but when you ask me, I don't know about it. It has no effect in block propagation because blocks are propagated regardless of whether there are fresh transactions in the transaction proposal zone. And other miners can still proceed with mining because there are enough proposed transactions to confirm. There's no need for miners to mine empty blocks because I know that there's a, 
range of blocks that in this transaction proposal zones, the last block cannot include these transactions, which is only available for me, so I can mine these transactions, contribute to transaction confirmation. And what if miners incorporate this proposed without broadcast transaction in their later blocks to gain a de facto selfish mining advantage? In Nakamoto consensus, the advantage of slot propagation is always useful in finding the next block. For a miner, I can always, after I find a block, I only tell the block hider and transfer the block really slowly. During this process, I'm the only one who can mine after this block. But in our protocol, it can only be used to slow down propagation and block afterwards because this propagated without broadcast transactions, um, only, the, only the selfish miner knows these transactions and only the selfish miner can use it as an advantage. However, it cannot be used in the next block because there need to, uh, there need to be a gap. The, it can, a miner can only mine transactions that are proposed between two and five blocks. Before that, you cannot mine a transaction in the pre proposed in the previous block, as I said. But only if that block is found by the attacker. Here's an illustration. In Nakamoto consensus, when the selfish miner finds block H, it can immediately start mining the, the H plus one block. However, honest miner can on, only start mining after re they receive the full block. And during the block propagation period, that's the selfish miner's advantage. However, in our protocol, when the selfish miner finds block H, honest miner can immediately start mining H plus one. And if the selfish miner wants to utilize this broadcast, uh, this proposed without broadcast transactions, it has to find the block, unblock afterwards. Only then can the selfish miner utilize this advantage. However, this happens less often. You cannot be sure that after seven blocks, there will be a block mined by me. It's very hard to, to predict that. So to best utilize bandwidth, our protocol uh, uses a different difficulty adjustment period, uh, mechanism, which targets a fixed orphan rate, counted as uncles in the last difficulty adjustment period. If the orphan rate, if the orphan rate in the last uh, difficulty adjustment period is below the target orphan rate, the difficulty will lower and the block interval will lower and the throughput would increase. In other words, that um, very few orphans means the network can synchronize transactions faster, which means we can increase the throughput without harming the transaction, uh, without uh, increasing the, uh, without harming the decentralization, whatever. <laughs> Otherwise, the difficulty increase and the block interval would also increase and the throughput will decrease. A higher orphan rate means the network cannot process this much transactions in a difficulty adjustment period. Then we can lower the throughput. And the block reward is proportional to the inverse of the expected block interval, so that the expect, expected total reward per difficulty adjustment period is fixed, which means if you have 10 minutes per block and each block has 12.5 Bitcoin, when you have five minutes per block, each block can have 6.125 Bitcoin. So the issue rate of uh, the currency is always fixed. Last, to defend against selfish mining. So recall that, um, so sorry, the difference between our protocol and Nakamoto consensus is that difficulty adjustment mechanism counts all blocks, including uncles, when estimating the total mining power. Same as Nakamoto consensus, without the attack, the attacker finds three blocks in 10, the honest miner finds seven. With the attack, the attacker finds three blocks in seven and the honest miner finds four. Three of the honest blocks are orphaned and the main chain grows slower. But recall that selfish mining is not profitable in the first difficulty adjustment period. What happens in the second difficulty adjustment period? In the next epoch, the difficulty will stay the same and the attacker cannot find more blocks with the same mining power. Therefore, selfish mining is no longer profitable. Is that... So in sum, our protocol makes use of orphan blocks. These are a symbol of orphan blocks. We want, to we want to reduce the number of orphans by two-step transaction confirmation. And after the orphan is reduced, we use the remaining ones as an indicator of bandwidth utilization to adjust the throughput. 
And given that uncle information is embedded in the blockchain already, we can use them to make selfish mining unprofitable. That will be all. Thank you. Thank you, Ren.